Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I have heard Father Chin yell into the audience, let's pray. So, uh, good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Clement Sedmak, and I serve as director of the Nanovic Institute for European Studies at the University of Notre Dame. I want to welcome you to the 2023 Laura Shannon Price Lecture and Award Presentation. The lecture will be delivered by the 2023 Laura Shannon Price winner, the Stella Stella Gervas, who will be introduced shortly by our esteemed colleague, Professor Brad Gregory. Welcome, Stella, our guest of honor. <laughs> Dear friends, welcome. Welcome to an event which takes place in the Elizabeth Nanovic Seminar Room. So Liz is present in spirit. And I should also mention that it is Bob Nanovic's birthday today. He has reached the age Hans-Georg Gadamer reached in 1991. <laughs> uh, please allow me to say a word about the prize. No, it's so easy to remember. He lived from 1900 till 2002, Hans-Georg Gadamer. Oh. You're welcome. You're welcome. You learned something. You're welcome. <laughs> Please allow me to say a few words about the prize. The Laura Shannon Prize was first awarded in 2010. Since even our current first year students were born at that point, it means that it is a young prize with a history. The Laura Shannon Prize, one of the preeminent prizes for European studies, is awarded annually to the best book in European studies that transcends a focus on any one country, state, or people to stimulate new ways of thinking about contemporary Europe as a whole. The prize has been created by Laura and Mike Shannon. Laura came to my predecessor, Jim McAdams, at one point and said, I want to do something really serious for the Nanovic, something that people will really understand the importance of for scholarship and for students. What about a prize, like a book prize? Jim, with his sound judgment, thought that this was a fantastic idea, and we all agree, I'm sure. So the Nanovic Institute is particularly indebted to Michael and Laura Shannon for this generous gift and their vision for creating it. It has become a significant part of the Nanovic Institute's mission and a way to reward and elevate scholarship, share the scholarship with the Notre Dame community, and connect jurors and a growing community of past winners. You are a current winner now and will be a past winner tomorrow. <laughs> My understanding is that more than 40 Nanovic Institute faculty fellows participated in the review process for this prize cycle. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to my wonderful colleagues, Grant Osborne and Grania McEvoy, who have shepherded the process along with so much respect for details. We are so grateful to Laura Shannon for her generous vision and her intellectual passion. As many of you know, our dear mentor and former advisory board member, Laura Shannon, passed away two years ago. May she be in the light of God who promises life in its fullness. Today and All Souls Day, we will remember Laura in a special way. Here on Earth, Laura's legacy continues. We are grateful as Laura's daughters, Claire and Kelly, have joined our advisory board. The Shannon family continues to be part of the Nanovic Institute. The jury for the 2023 Laura Shannon Prize in Humanities awarded the Laura Shannon Prize to Stella Gervas, professor of history and the Eugen Weber, Eugen Weber, a chair in modern European history at the University of California, Los Angeles, for her book, Conquering Peace from the Enlightenment to the European Union, published by Harvard University Press. The final jury also awarded a Laura Shannon Prize silver medal to Emily Grebler for her book, Muslims and the Making of Modern Europe, and to Mira Siegelberg for her book, Statelessness, a Modern History, but there's only one winner, and that's you, Stella. <laughs> the 2023 Prize jury was composed of an accomplished group of scholars from across the humanities. Laura Lee Downs, Professor of History, European University Institute. Brad Gregory, Henkel's Family College, Professor of History here in Notre Dame. Katie Hayward, Professor of Political Sociology at Queen's University Belfast, Aileen Hunt, Professor of Political Science here at Notre Dame, and Helmut Walzer Smith, Martha Rivers Ingram, Professor of History, Vanderbilt University. We are very grateful for their work. Without a jury, no prize, but obviously without prize worthy books, no jury. So let me please turn things over to one of the eminent jurors, Professor Brad Gregory. Brad is the Henkel's Family College Professor of History here at Notre Dame. He's impressive. He's also a faculty, I don't say that about everybody, he's impressive. <laughs> he's also a faculty fellow of the Nanovic Institute and we are honored to have him as a colleague. Brad's principal research interests center on Christianity in the Reformation era, but he's also interested in methodology and theory in the understanding of religion history and in macro-historical matters. We're looking forward to the next magisterial book and the Anthropocene. Brad is a public intellectual, which means he's a brilliant person with an audience. 
He has given many interviews. There are many videos and podcasts featuring his thinking. I found one with the lovely title, How Does Historian Brad Gregory Make a Boring Topic So Mind-Blowing? <laughs> I am not saying that introducing Stella Garras is a boring task. I'm also not saying <laughs> that her amazing book is boring. I'm just saying that Brad has the gift of making exciting things even more exciting. Let us look forward to an exciting introduction. Brad will introduce Stella and her book. Then Stella will give her Laura Shannon a prize lecture. We will take between 42 and 44 minutes. <laughs> After that, we have some time for Q&A. We will end at 6.10 or so, so that we can use the final five minutes to officially bestow the award. Brad, please, if you were kind enough to introduce Stella. I'm sure that, like many of the rest of you, I'm hoping deeply that someday the Nanovic will get a director with a bit of energy and a sense of humor. <laughs> but for now, we have to make do with Clemens. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome. It's a real pleasure and a genuine honor to introduce Stella Gerbis, now the Eugene Weber Chair in Modern European History at UCLA, and the recipient of this year's Laura Shannon Prize from the Nanovic Institute here at Notre Dame. Professor Gervis has held, had a distinguished international career as a scholar of modern European diplomatic, political, and intellectual history since earning her two doctorates, one in history at the University of Bucharest in 2001, the second in European studies at the University of Geneva in 2002. A few of her invited lectureships or stints as a visiting scholar include stays at the Institut d'études politiques in Bordeaux, the Center for European Studies at Harvard, the Collège de France in Paris, the University of Sydney in Australia, the Durham University Law School in the UK, and the University of St. Petersburg in Russia. She's written two books on the 19th century Russian diplomat of Romanian background, Alexander Sturda, both of which won book prizes. Her current major project is a history of the Black Sea region from the late 18th century to the 1920s, the linguistic and other scholarly demands for such a study are daunting, to say the least. We're here at this afternoon, as you know, to celebrate her book, Conquering Peace from the Enlightenment to the European Union, published by Harvard University Press in 2021. Simply put, this book is an original magisterial synthesis about a matter of fundamental importance, spanning the entire European continent over more than three centuries. Other than that, other than that it's not very ambitious. <laughs> it, it's a brilliant example of the ways in which the parts of an ambitious study set within a complex whole cast unexpected light on both the whole and the parts. In this case, an integration of political, diplomatic, military, international legal, and intellectual history to analyze the outcomes and legacies of five major European conflicts. Starting from a post-Westphalian baseline in the mid-17th century, Professor Gervis moves through the War of the Spanish Succession, the Napoleonic Wars, World Wars I and II, and the Cold War, to the formation of the European Union, including its current challenges and discontents. She sets this within a dialectical perspective on the relationship between a realist-minded balance of powers and a striving for an ethos of perpetual, that is, enduring peace. Professor Gervis's mastery of five massive, distinct and discrete historiographies is no less impressive than it is rare, as is her capacity to narrate their connectedness in the formation of a tradition across the dramatic changes of Europe as a whole, attending to rival conceptual, divergent empirical, and differing international expressions. Not many scholars know the ins and outs of the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 and 14, as well as they know about the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991-92. The flexible model here that integrates war and peace as part of the same continuum, pertaining both to concrete conditions between states and to states of mind or spirits, is broached in the introduction serves as an implicit analytical framework throughout the book's five chapters and is revisited in convincing fashion in the conclusion. Conquering Peace is a stellar model of a study whose interpretative model emerges unobtrusively from vast research and deep reflection. On top of the remarkable historical analysis per se, 
Professor Gervis keeps her eye throughout on practical matters pertaining to peace building in the present and for the future. This comes to the fore especially in her conclusion. From its huge chronological and geographical ambition to the importance of its subject matter, incisive analysis, historiographical mastery, superbly readable prose, and ramifications for diplomats and politicians, as well as for scholars in multiple disciplines in many fields, conquering peace is a stunning achievement that is likely to become a classic. As Professor Gervis writes in her conclusion, Modern European history shows that all the states, none excepted, that have followed this path of grandeur with militaristic ideologies and offensive armies have ended their course in the land of decadence, whether through military defeat or economic failure. In contrast, political greatness has repeatedly been found in the social bonds of togetherness and economic prosperity that only lasting peace can afford. Peace is for the strong, war is for the weak. A beautiful idea, beautifully expressed, and one rendered almost unbearably poignant since February 24th, 2022, when in the year after Conquering Peace appeared, not a great man, but a far from great man, plunged Europe into its first major land war since 1945 a conflict, sadly, with no end in sight. Professor Gervis's talk this afternoon is entitled The Peace Conundrum in European History. Please join me in welcoming again to Notre Dame and to the Nanavik Institute this year's winner of the Laura Shannon Prize, Professor Stella Gervis. Please thrilled and honored to receive the 2023 Laura Shannon Prize and grateful for this welcome recognition of the power of peace. Historians tend to consider their published work as a testament for posterity. Yet, those who are most likely to read and judge it belong to the here and now. I would like to start by expressing my gratitude to the members of uh, the imminent jury for their kind words. I also wish to thank the vibrant team of the Nanovic Institute, Clement Sedmak, Grant Osborne, Rebecca Prince, Morgan Manson, Melanie Webb, Peter Boyle, Key, and I am sure, please forgive me if I forgot someone, so it's, uh, it has been a pleasure to engage in conversations with the fellows and uh, interact with the students uh, of Notre Dame University uh, I met during my visit. And last but not least, I would like to thank the family of Laura Shannon Price for their generosity and uh, in recognizing and honoring works on modern Europe, including my book, Conquering Peace. Today, it matters more than ever that we recommit to international peace and an award such as this one helps us do just that. Talking about peace is challenging enough in normal times. But these are far from normal times. In light of the recent upsetting events in Ukraine, Israel and Gaza, and rising tensions between the United States with both Russia and China, the history of peace could seem outdated, even a distraction. With war drums now echoing in both Europe and in the Middle East, is it still legitimate to associate the idea of peace with the idea of Europe? The history of the European continent has always been filled with violence. 
Historian Mark Mazaur aptly called it the dark continent. The fragmentation and the anarchy of European states caused wars with incalculable devastation. The result has been a martial history of Europe that delights military historians, biographers of great generals, and political philosophers alike, but that brought pain and suffering to the average European. Conversely, peace has long been regarded as less glamorous than war. It might therefore seem paradoxical that I devoted a whole book, Conquering Peace, to understanding why and how the term peace had become so prominent in European political discourse. To overcome the prejudice against peace, I aim to trace the genealogy of this crucial and multifaceted political concept over the long durée. To see how reflections on peace and peacemaking over the centuries materialized in treaties concluded in the aftermath of great wars, fought to avert the threat of pan-continental empire in Europe. I was particularly concerned with answering why only a voluntary unification of all states could alleviate the fear of continental empires and new wars. Uniting diverse nations with distinct traditions, languages, and customs was never a self-evident proposition, especially because it clashed with the late 19th century concept of the nation state as a fully sovereign entity. It remains controversial today. This brings us to the theme of tonight's lecture, which I have entitled The Peace Conundrum in European History. Simply put, how is it possible to achieve lasting peace while guaranteeing the liberties of all states. To start with, I would like to expose two misconceptions on the subject of peace, which have been a source of much confusion. The first can be summed up in the maxim, civis pacem parabellum, if you want peace, prepare for war. It's a commonplace that could already be found in a military strategy handbook by the Latin author Vegetius. One could also invoke Otto von Bismarck's Realpolitik or the post-war American realist school, which considers preventive or preemptive war as a legitimate tool of foreign relations. The problem with this approach is that it is, I will see, as we will see, in complete contradiction with the idea of Europe. To adopt it out of hand would be to close one's mind on the fundamental agreements that underlay the international order. The second misconception at the opposite end of the ideological specter spectrum is a specific form of pacifism understood as an unconditional rejection of war, of all conflict. This is the ideal of nonviolence, which was notably embraced by the Protestant Quakers. As a reminder, one could cite the New Testament precept, after all, we are Notre Dame, and I quote, if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone wants to sue you for your tunic, let him have your garments also. Matthew 5. Yet, the prin this principle of pacifism was never applied in the foreign policy of European states. In support of this assertion, we can't jump 
ahead to Article 51 of the United Nations Charter, which considers war in self-defense to be an inherent right. By contrast, Article 39 of the same document regards the war of aggression as a grave breach of the peace. It is commonly accepted today that the recourse of war must be governed by three principles. Last resort, proportionality, and discrimination, meaning do not harm civilians and non-combatants. Conversely, once it is accepted that waging war is legitimate in certain cases, it is incumbent upon the victorious powers to make peace after war. That is where things get complicated. It's one thing to reestablish a peace that settles the causes of a war that has just ended. Achieving a lasting peace is quite another. To understand uh, the challenges of creating a lasting peace, I will present three main arguments. First, war and peace belong to the same continuum. Second, war is a judicial duel fought to determine the future peace. Third, war, war is an illness when lasting peace is a state of health. To go forward, it is often a sound idea to look backwards. In conquering peace, I focused on the aftermath of five great continental wars since 1700, each of which completely altered the political map of Europe and had been caused by the impending threat of a pan-continental empire. The first, the War of the Spanish Succession, caused by the bid of the French king Louis XIV for European hegemony, 1701-1714. The second, the Napoleonic Wars and the French Empire, 1799-1815. The third, the First World War and the Second German Reich, 1914-1918. Then the Second World War and the Third Reich, 1939-1945. And finally, the Cold War and the Soviet hegemony over half of Europe, 1947-1991. Why those five episodes and not others? They are, in fact, connected by a definite pattern composed of three stages. A real threat of conquest by a European pan-continental empire, then a great continental war precipitating political and economic chaos, and after the war, some new bold ideas for establishing a new international order out of that confusion. Each of these five episodes was a moment in the advancement of what I call the engineering of peace. Each moment gave birth to something extraordinary, a distinctive spirit, as in a team spirit from the French esprit de corps, a spirit of peace that brought together monarchs or political leaders, diplomats, and members of civil society acting as veritable peace engineers, they progressively developed original mechanisms and institutions aimed at maintaining peace and preventing conflict, while consciously drawing on the intellectual tradition that French call the art de la paix, the art of peacemaking. War and peace belong to the same continuum of reality. After all, how did each of these five great European wars start? Each began with some political dream of self-aggrandizement 
at the expense of neighbors. Complete with the caricatural slogan, it will all be over by Christmas. This was a recurring phenomenon in all of our episodes. There is, however, a risk inherent to having had lasting peace in Western Europe as we had since 1945. And that is amnesia, amnesia of past wars. As decades go, there are less and less people left alive who remember what it meant to live in a country collectively fighting a large scale war. But then changes of generations occur, the bad memories tend to be forgotten, and military adventurism goes back into fashion. As a consequence, we are witnessing today the same phenomenon that regularly occurred in times of war in the past. Seeking peace becomes identified with the refusal to fight. That leads us to the crux of our disturbing question. Does a genuine pursuit of peace necessarily lead to a rejection of the use of all military force and the war in all its forms? The answer is no. And this is easily proved if we consider how each of those five great wars ended. Each belligerent fought for a set of war aims. Those aims always included some idea of peace after the war. After several years of uncountable casualties, displaced populations and war atrocities, the belligerents in each conflict finally start considering that humanity would be far better off if it could eliminate the misery of war. Peacemaking in each of those five episodes was thus not a denial of the war, but the best way to reap the benefits of the war and to ensure peace in the future. Let's therefore make a clear distinction between peacemaking and nonviolence, a distinction mentioned at the beginning of my lecture. The European tradition of peace, which had evolved into international law, never ruled out war. What it, is what it affirmed is that negotiation, mediation, arbitration, or a judicial court are all preferable to war and should be made use or of to avoid it. Indeed, all of the thinkers of the so-called perpetual peace family of the 18th century observed the existence of war as a matter of course and never considered a categorical prohibition on making war. They did not consider war immoral per se. What they did consider unjust and immoral was the use of military violence for grabbing the walls of others or their land, or, and this is important, when peaceful means were still available to settle a dispute. So starting an aggression war is unforgivable, but also starting a war by negligence, by laziness, because one could not be bothered to negotiate, or by political vainglory is also an unforgivable sin. Not only in front of God, but one that should be publicly condemned in the here below by a court. And that is the spirit of international law as it evolved in Europe. Conversely, the international law never assumed that such peaceful means were, were always available, especially when, when one was facing a military aggression or an invasion army. 
To conclude that point, a country wages war as a last resort, as a legitimate self-defense, as a cas de force majeure. That leads us to a very important notion, which is the function of war in European history. To quote uh, the theoretician of war, von Clausewitz, following Grossius on that, war is nothing but a duel on a larger scale. There is a deep belief in the legitimacy of war when contained within definite limits. That may be viewed from the perspective of the tribal customs of Germanic Europe, where the purpose of a private judicial duel, also known as a trial by combat, was to determine which party was right and which was wrong, based on the belief that the Lord gives victory to his anointed. Similarly, in a war between sovereign states, the victorious power gains the right to write in, and enforce the clauses in the post-war settlement treaty, as in Vienna in uh, 1815 uh, or in Versailles in uh, 1919. The clauses of the peace treaty, particularly of a territorial and economic nature, determine the new legal status quo. What would they after be considered right and wrong? Just to give one example of the clash between the rules and norms of the international legal system and the notion of war as a judicial duel. The Soviet Union exerted military hegemony on Eastern Europe from 1940, 1945 to 1989. We know that the USSR had soundly defeated the German Third Reich in the Second World War. As a result, it had obtained a privileged position as a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. <coughs> International law firmly condemned any violations of another state's sovereignty. Yet, the UN could not validly take action against the USSR actions in Eastern Europe because of the latter's special position. <coughs> this conclusion is certainly not very encouraging. There is, however, another way of looking at war and peace. One big idea that I covered in my book is that, that the international community should not, should not be treated as a machine or a random collection of pieces, but as a whole, as a living organism, which each state as an organ or a cell. This organic metaphor is not new at all. It was only forgotten during the age of steel machinery. It can be found in the French Encyclopédie of the 18th century, a major collection of the Enlightenment, as part of the entry on peace by the French writer Etienne Noël de Milaville. The entry says that war is a convulsive and violent disease of the body politic. That is, of the international community. Several authors, such as Hobbes, had early insisted that peace had to be invented because the natural condition of humanity was war. Here, Damilaville was raising a strong objection. Yes, war was a part of the human condition, but stating that war was the natural condition of humanity was a misconception, just as stating that illness was the natural condition of the human body. 
war was described as a pathological condition, not humanity's healthy condition. Indeed, Abbé de Saint-Pierre, a French writer and diplomat of the early 18th century, wrote that the role of peacemakers, rulers, diplomats, statesmen, has been to be the medical doctors of societies. European states progressively elaborated a set of commonly accepted diplomatic practices that rejected the assumption that war was unavoidable. At the same time, they recognized that a defensive war was not only justified, but sometimes an unfortunate necessity. The notion that the country would lay down weapons in case of aggression as an act of protest against war was simply preposterous. Hence, for example, the war against the French em Emperor Napoleon in the early 19th century became an obvious necessity for four great powers, Austria, Prussia, Russia, and um, Britain, to ally in order to restore the so-called balance of power. They huddled together a military coalition to prevent the French Empire from overwhelming all of Europe. The same later applied to the necessity of forging a vast alliance to defeat Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. A balance of power, however, is a tool to win a war, not to maintain lasting peace. There has been much debate about this over the centuries in the confrontation between NATO and uh, the Warsaw Pact um, uh, during the Cold War, as well as NATO and Russia today. Saint Pierre had pre presciently written in his plan for perpetual peace of 1713 that the balance of power, a European configuration of states where two military alliances would oppose each other, would never be in a state of true peace. On the contrary, it would always be at best in a state of what he called armed truce. And the risk would always be present that those two opposed coalitions would restart the vicious cycle of an arms race, which might then degenerate into another war destruction and general impoverishment. Saint Pierre thus described any situation of balance of power as a state of war, which is a brutally honest term. Hence the balance of power as a principle of international order would be an unhealthy condition of the political body of the international community. The current events in Ukraine are a case in point, demonstrating that a long-term situation of balance of power between Russia and its neighbors leads to war, not peace. Indeed, a well-known maxim is that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If a country as Ukraine has reached the fateful moment when Hannibal is at the gates and preparations must be made to fight a bloody siege, a responsible attitude would be to say that Europe failed to apply the proper prophylaxis. That was, in any case, Winston Churchill's views on the errors that had led to the rise of the Third Reich's terrifying military power. That is how he summarized it in his famous speech in the House of Commons on February 22, 1938. I quote, 
a firm stand by France and Britain with the other powers associated with them at that time and with the authority of the League of Nations would have been followed by the immediate German evacuation of the Rhineland without the shedding of a drop of blood. And the effects of that might have been blessed beyond all compare because it would have enabled the more prudent elements of the German army to gain their proper position and would not have given to the political head of Germany the enormous ascendancy which has enabled him to move forward." End quote. Nonetheless, preventive war is not always justified and can be even irrational. Just as it would be irrational to inoculate a convulsive disease to a sane patient in order to prevent the same disease. Regarding today's Russian-Ukrainian war, not to mention the Israeli-Gaza conflict, we lack historical distance. Yet, since war and peace exist on the same plane of reality, it is clear that peace can only be reached by acknowledging the existence of war and understanding its dual essence, both as a judicial dual and as a disease of the international community. Let's revisit the intellectual roots of the idea of peace to establish the vocabulary and grammar of that evolution. Peace is a polysemic word. It has multiple meanings. A definition of peace would be the absence of war between states or of civil war between communities. However, it would be a simplistic form of peace. If we have two opposing blocks, their relations might be characterized as a truce or a ceasefire, a phony war or a cold war with two armies in constant alert on both sides of a military line, like in Germany between 1945 and 1989. Could one reason, reasonably call that a state of peace? Certainly not. What do you truly mean by peace? This ideal state of health of the international communities that we are looking for. During the Enlightenment era, philosopher, philosophers spoke of Pax Perpetua, perpetual peace. Of course, peace was never eternal. As Immanuel Kant, following Leibniz, dryly noted, the only eternal peace was the peace of the graveyard. Today, we would use the phrase lasting peace, an expression that became prevalent in the diplomatic uh, parlance uh, on the, of the 20th century. What we truly mean by lasting peace is a situation where there is a relatively harmonious interrelation among states or within a community, trust, trade, free and orderly circulation of people, goods, and ideas. This would be a state of good health of the international community, a state of peace, to use the terms of the 18th century. In order to achieve lasting peace, Saint-Pierre proposed the creation of a system of peace a federation of states that would guarantee the status quo of borders, complete with an international court of justice. Later, Jean-Jacques Rousseau elaborated on the model of Saint-Pierre to make it more accessible. But he also posed a critical question. Why would greedy kings agree 
to reduce their ambitions and surrender their sovereignty to become part of a federation, of a system of peace. The flaw in St. Pierre's plan of European Federation was that there was too much distance from theory to practice. That seemed a complete utopia at the time. At the end of the 18th century, Immanuel Kant made a remarkable synthesis of some of these ideas in his sketch, Zum Ewigen Frieden, Frieden, towards perpetual peace. And yet, this idea of perpetual peace did make its way up to the minds of kings and heads of state who toyed with it cautiously in uh, the manner of cuts. Now, the challenge was how to turn this lofty idea into a practical reality. Each of these five post-war episodes I mentioned was a moment in the advancement of the engineering of lasting peace. These experiments were conducted at the end of each great continental war. The term engineering implies that each new spirit of peace built on the previous experience to achieve the same goal, lasting peace. To delve further, let's explore the advancements made in these five episodes. The first, the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713, established the principle of coexistence between European states known as the balance of power. So the balance of, of power principle appeared literally in the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713. At the same time, Abbé de Saint-Pierre and other philosophers of the Enlightenment firmly put a European Union and uh, on the map with their plans of perpetual peace, at least on an imaginary map. I would like to mention, to emphasize the fact that Abbé de Saint-Pierre did use the term of European Union in his plan of perpetual peace of 1713. So two, more than two centuries before the European integration process after the Second World War. The second moment, the spirit of Vienna, the treaties of 1814-15, and the birth of the Congress system, which will be lately called the Concert of Europe, which acted as a board of directors for the continent, marked a moment of an uh, unparalleled but temporary cooperation among uh, great powers in Europe not to mention the Treaty of the Holy Alliance of 1815, which had a fundamentally important and counterintuitive political consequence, which changed forever the way the great powers conceived the European world. Let's not forget that all the negotiators, including Tsar Alexander I and Metternich, were minds of the late Enlightenment. The third moment, the spirit of Geneva, after the Treaty of Versailles and accompanying treaties after World War I, which generated a new international organization, a machinery of peace called the League of Nations, a lineal ancestor of today's United Nations. So the term of machinery of peace indeed why I was used at the time. The fourth moment, after World War II, came the European integration of the early 1950s and the first European communities. And a fantastic breakthrough, the so-called functionalism. As French statesman Robert Schumann wrote, I quote, Europe will not be made all at once or according to a single plan. Europe will be built through concrete achievements which first 
create a de facto solidarity, end quote. Schumann abandoned all prior attempts at unification, but had discovered the magic formula. The fifth and last episode, which started in 1989, also embraced Central and Eastern Europe. This moment defines the reunification of Germany after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the establishment of the European Union in 1992, and the enlargement of the EU to the east. This process shows that the aim of peace fostered the political idea of Europe over the centuries long before the EU and even before the age of nation state. Seen in that enlarged perspective, the European Union is merely the latest and even possibly not the last of attempts to achieve the idea of Europe as a space of political peace. Amidst this context, a final crucial question arises. How can we achieve a state of lasting peace? The study of five continental European wars shows that the process of establishing lasting peace has been a gradual process, which always followed more or less the same pattern. To end the fight, there needs to be first a ceasefire with two possible forms. There are no 10 or 20 forms, there are only two, armistice or capitulation. That stops the convulsions. Then a peace treaty is of course a step for reestablishing the conditions of peace between two opposing states. A peace treaty is a step forward, but is by no means sufficient. Because a settlement treaty is only a closure of the past, there must also be a system for maintaining the peace in the future. To paraphrase Immanuel Kant, peace must be instituted. This will eventually lead to a system for maintaining the peace through some form of international system or peace alliance. And mark my words, to really achieve peace, you need reconciliation, like the reconciliation between Germany and France after World War II. That's the convalescence. Finally, a solidarity established through the circulation of people, goods, and ideas. Montesquieu would have called this kind of solidarity the mares that keep peoples solidly bound together. To conclude, it is of course tempting in the urgency of our time to focus on the immediate and necessary preparations for surviving the aggression and winning battles. Unfortunately, believing that peace will somehow take care of itself after a ceasefire or a military victory has repeatedly proved to be a pious wish leading to bitter disappointments. As European experience shows, anything that can go wrong after war, if left to itself, will probably go wrong. The errors lies in the implicit belief in the cathartic virtues of V day. As if, as if the great moment of victory can be expected to bring some kind a friend of history. Unfortunately, the wheel of time, of time does not stop turning. Uh, the destructive 
but essential effort of fighting the war left the field of ruins. It is merely the prelude to a vast and patient process of reconstruction. If one wishes to reap the benefits of a defensive war, one should immediately plan for the most desirable post-war outcome possible. As a court attributed to Aristotle states, it is not enough to win a war. It is more important to organize the peace. Today, in the current war of Russia against Ukraine, we are far from this historical pattern of lasting peace described in my book, Conquering Peace. The Russian Federation was never really at peace with all its neighbors after the collapse of the Soviet Union in December 1991. The occupation of Moldova's breakaway region of Transnistria occurred almost immediately in 1992. In 2008, the Kremlin launched an invasion of Georgia uh, in support of separatist governments in South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Six years later, Russia seized Crimea from Ukraine and began supporting an insurgency of pro-Russian separatists in the Donbas. In February 2022, Russia militarily aggressed Ukraine, starting a new phase of the conflict. There had never been a state of peace in the region since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And that had been during the Cold War, which was not peace either. So what about the future? Historians do not have a crystal ball, but we can at least bring to bear our knowledge of the past. In this instance, by warning that preparing the post-war order for Ukraine is an assignment that should be worked on starting now. Alas, believing that applying mere diplomatic negotiation right now could solve today's Ukrainian questions does not appear realistic. Uh, the disappointing attempts at Munich in 1938 and uh, in Yalta in 1945, suggest that, that appeasement is not an appropriate tool against a power whose plans of expansion have been drawn out over several years. Indeed, the fait accompli of the annexation of Crimea in 2014 did not prevent a full-scale invasion of Ukraine eight years later. Returning to the future of Ukraine in the heart of Europe, common sense dictates that Ukraine should not settle again for a political relationship with Russia that would merely lay a cover of ashes over the latter's embers of revanchism, last for military revenge, and irredentism, the desire to get lands back with the risk that violence could spiral out again within our lifetimes. Achieving lasting peace in Europe will require that the Russian state changes its ways with uh, its neighbors and uh, unreservedly accepts the rule of international law. In short, Winning the war will not be enough to guarantee the security and freedom of Ukraine. Peace will have to be conquered after the war at the price of great and long efforts. As for yet another conflict between Israel and Hamas, 
which rages as I speak. It is yet another symptom of the weaknesses and divisions of the international system today, with a dreadful sense of a déjà vu. There we find the cruel siren of war that killed millions of Europeans, revanchism, the urge to inflict more human losses and pain to civilians in order to avenge the human losses and pain that civilians have suffered. Stating that the reconciliation is the only way out is not an angelic statement. It is what political leaders in France and Germany had no choice but to do after World War II, because the alternative would have been to succumb together to a new form of tyranny and terror. At the time, it would have been Stalin's totalitarianism. That is not to forget the innumerable conflicts that are plaguing our world, but which media choose not to cover for their own reason. Not too far around, let us not forget Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh, Sudan, Yemen, Saharan and Sub-Saharan Africa, and so many others. Please forgive me for those I failed to mention because they are too many to count. In all those cases, the heroes will be those who end the war. Choosing peace and reconciliation over war is by far the toughest option and the one that requires the most inner strength because it it is a solitary footpath of love. It requires leaving the paved highway of the least effort, which is to embrace the hatred of the crowd and to pursue a war of vendetta at the risk of mutual annihilation. Next time, we wish to erect a statue to a true hero who embodies the virtues of personal integrity and courage, I suggest we select a peacemaker. I hope that this might shed a light on the profound meaning of the last phrases of my book. And in this, you know, I'm really happy that we are having the same conclusion, we are on the same page. And I will quote, the condition to remaining strong is to forge ahead relentlessly toward a goal, the goal of a just and lasting peace arrived at by equals. Peace is for the strong and war is for the weak. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have about 10 minutes after this brilliant lecture for comments, Q&A, or footnotes. The floor is open. We have a mic. Bill Donahue, question one. I hope there's no feedback. Uh, thank you for a really enlightening lecture. Uh, I really enjoyed it and learned a great deal. I couldn't agree more with your, I, your ideals. Um, I do want to ask a little bit about the analysis because it seems to me that to your presentation it's important to periodize. Um, and so you mark a number of wars and then subsequent pieces uh, or periods of peace. But I, I find it a little problematic to group the post-war period or to call those two different periods. You have one that begins in 1950 and one that begins in 1992. Um, and so a kind of a group of questions, is the Cold War really a war? And if it's a war, is it like the other wars? 
Uh, I have no doubt about the, the conflicts, the Berlin crisis in 48 and the uprisings in 53 and Poznan in 57, the Berlin Wall in 61, Czechoslovakia in 68. But nevertheless, we tend to refer to it overall as a period of great peace. Um, and th then to kind of separate that out and say that we're having a new period starting in 92 is, is also confusing and perhaps not all that Persuasive Wolf Biermann recently said, you know, that the, the Cold War never really ended, uh, and that it uh, one sign of that is, you know, that the, that which was expected in 91, 92 happened, you know, on February 24th, 2022. You know, the reckoning has finally come, uh, suggesting there's a continuity, so no periodization. Um, and related to that, I guess, is um, w beneath and beyond this, but very much present and possibly guaranteeing the peace in Europe is NATO, uh, a military alliance. Um, and of course, the, the, the fact that both sides before, prior to uh, 91, 92 were armed to the teeth with uh, nuclear weapons. Um, so I'm just trying to get uh, understand that better because I don't really see those as subsequent periods of war and peace. It seems to be much more complex, but I may have misunderstood. Thank you. Sorry, could you put on your oh. mic? The little button, just this little button, you need it. it will, now, now it's on. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much uh, for your question. Um, the fifth and final moment in this uh, overview on European history uh, of peace is um, what I call the peace spirit of enlarged Europe. Um, so, uh, and um, the period of the Cold War, so the peace uh, built after the fall of uh, the Berlin Wall and the end of the Soviet Union. And that allowed me to introduce in my story the Central and Eastern European countries. So, indeed, the perception from the West of the Cold War we can debate was that a state of peace or it was as the philosophers of enlightenment would have called an armed truce because there was a balance of power. So the balance of power, it's just a tool to maintain temporary, you know, it's an armed truce. So that it will explode one day or another. Uh, but uh, that period of the Cold War um, in the eastern part of the continent was called the 50 years war uh, from 1939 from the uh, pact, uh, the pact Molotov-Ribbentrop pact of uh, Nazi Germany and uh, Stalinist uh, Soviet Union and until 1989. So that it's a very different perception of that Cold War which was called indeed the 50 years war. So that it's a very different way to look uh, at that uh, period of the Cold War. Uh, was that a state of peace? Uh, if you consider the definitions provided by the philosophers of the Enlightenment, but also this exploration of a long direct history of Europe that was not a state of peace, but a state of war. So that it's a my response to, to your question, so. So we have about 10 more minutes, not much more than that. So we have one, two, three. Brief questions or comments, please. Okay, hi. Thank you very much. I greatly enjoyed uh, the lecture. You presented it as a sort of a long durée analysis. So I have a question about the temporal structure of, yeah. of your argument. Mm -hmm. So you used the long durée to sort of describe the deepening of peace over the, the history of, of, of Europe. But then the explanation focuses on these five different post-war uh, conferences. And that is very sort of eventful. That is, you, you, you focus mostly on elites, right, making sort of decisions. Mm -hmm. You use the analogy of, of uh, peacemaking and, and in engineering. So my question is twofold. What role did learning play in this peacemaking? And how did that learning carry over from one episode to the next? And the second one, given that you use a long durée analysis, what role did some long durée background factors play that you don't really address? I mean, we have the rise of capitalism, democratization, the rule of law, colonialism, mm -hmm. 
uh, presumably these long durée factors must have shaped these five moments as well, and if so, mm -hmm. what role did they play? Thank you. Wonderful, you make my life easier. <laughs> then Alex would be next. <laughs> well, I, I also wanted to thank you for this really interesting lecture. And I had a question on a particular point. My, my, one of the things I take, took away from your five cases is that wars of aggression are not a good idea and mm. are not an effective way for a country to improve its long-term prospects. Now, I'm wondering how do cases fit in where wars of aggression are actually really successful? And one example I would say is the war that led to the unification of Italy mm -hmm. in 1860. Mm -hmm. And another is actually the two wars, the, the, the three wars of German unification. Mm -hmm. All of which, in both cases, produced the permanent unification of these two countries mm -hmm. and did not create a gigantic crisis. And Bismarck and Cavour had every reason afterwards to congratulate themselves on on a job well done. So I'm wondering, are those exceptions mm -hmm. kind of that prove the rule, or mm -hmm. do they, mm -hmm. how do those fit into your larger structure? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So thank you very much for uh, your question. So the long durée first. Um, so, um, um, and how the political leaders or the statesmen, what they learned from the previous experience of peacemaking, right? So, um, uh, so um, I found explicit uh, um, uh, links, explicit and implicit links about how the plans of perpetual peace, for example, the Enlightenment inspired the statesmen of the Congress of Vienna one century later when they were discussing the new um, peace settlement in Europe. Um, to give just an example, Tsar Alexander I read Abbé de Saint-Pierre. So there was notice Metternich was one of the students uh, of Kant, of Emmanuel Kant. They were familiar with this literature, with this, uh, uh, with lit this literature on perpetual peace, on lasting peace, right? And that was one of the sources that you have explicit references that they are definitely influenced. And uh, each of these steps, I'm not saying it's a kind of progressive development, you know, but there it's, we are building on the shoulders of giants, so a previous one. Another example, um, uh, during uh, the World War I and the preparation of uh, the Treaty of Paris um, uh, uh, at the end of World War I, the British delegation um, uh, collected all these plans of perpetual peace of the 18th and 19th century under a volume um, uh, called the Fillimore Report, and which was distributed to all members of the uh, American delegation and British delegation uh, in Paris. And it's a fascinating document because you can see that it's not only the three main peace plans uh, uh, I mentioned of uh, Abid St. Pierre Rousseau and Kant, but there was a collection of more than six, 60 documents, 60 peace plans written uh, in the previous centuries. So uh, that is a really fascinating literature because uh, it was almost a kind of literary genre everyone was writing peace plans. Everyone was obsessed with this idea of how to stop the war, not just to reestablish peace after a great war and you know, fighting again two years later, but how to maintain, how keeping peace. So that is indeed, that's why I call it an engineering of peace, but there are some explicit and uh, implicit references. Read the book. So that I was thinking, you know, it's a, so it's a <laughs> so it's um, um, yes, and one is an, another remark, very interesting observation you made, indeed that it's a history of um, I was interested on the what we call international peace, right? The art of uh, international or interstate peace, and. Um, uh, 
mentioning that it's uh, kind of a top-down, right, history, because, of course, we have also bottom-up approach with uh, different pacifist movements, right, so that it's uh, the role of the civil society, which get more and more important during the 19th century, and especially 20th century, right? It was a decision, a choice I had to make, and it has to get uh, to have something with my sources, my main sources. The two big um, founts of sources, in, uh, on one hand, uh, is that uh, all this literature of perpetual peace and the reflection on peace and war in Europe, the ideas on peace, and I was very interested to follow how these ideas materialized in concrete peace treaties after the Great Wars. So it's a link trying to bridge theory and practice, right, and ideas with the political experience. So, and so the, my second very important um, um, uh, material uh, and sources there was uh, peace treaties. So that explains perhaps somehow my approach. Thank you. Can you have a, a one minute response to Alex's question about the uh, successful <laughs> aggression, <laughs> wars of aggression? <laughs> well, I see. So yes, the, you mentioned the war of uh, national emancipations and, uh, and we can also consider, uh, you know, add to that the war of the Greek emancipation in the 1820s and other Balkan countries, and, uh, and so that it's, uh, was not part of my pattern, because as I mentioned, there were three clear criteria. So I was looking towards what you call continental wars. So it's not bilateral wars, so it's not national wars. Um, it's uh, really a continental war, and when there was a direct, immediate menace provided by one of the pan-continental empire, the risk of uh, menace for all European states. Thank you. So I think it was clear enough. Mm -hmm. Olivier, <laughs> very, very short. I would like, um, Last question, by the way. peace and war in, uh, in the history of Europe. So one question is uh, specifically philosophical. I was wondering if you had considered studying or quoting, I haven't read the book yet, uh, texts that include um, um, you know, a reflection, a critical reflection, right? Uh, the construction even on uh, all the peace treaties that have been written over the Enlightenment period from the perspective of the peacemaker. And, and by that I mentioned I would like to mention just one text that I felt the urge to reread over the past few days for some reason, which is Emmanuel Levinas's uh, mm -hmm. Politique Après, mm -hmm. you know, Politics After, which is about, and uh, not only, you write what he called the messianic uh, visit that Anwar El Sadat paid to Jerusalem uh, mm -hmm. on November 17, uh, 1979, right? In which uh, Levinas doesn't have enough words and sarcasms against Immanuel Kant's, you know, Traité de Paix, pe pe I mean, to mm -hmm. Zum Ewigen Frieden, mm -hmm. right? The peace treaties. Um, I was really wondering if you had thought about integrating this reflection, because this is a very critical body of work that goes beyond the notion, the Obesian notion mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. states and the states of nature, and also the, what you call beautifully the judicial tradition. Here. That's one mm -hmm. question. The, the second question is very quick. Don't make I was that wondering. <laughs> I was wondering why you, you did not quote the peace treaties, what's referred to at the, as the peace treaties of Osnabrück, which mm -hmm. is known also in Latin as an instrumentum, which quite literally means it's a machine, right, from 1648, and also why colonization and the decolonization is not mentioned mm -hmm. uh, in your reflection. That's mm -hmm. all. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a short mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so... Um, to answer by, um, uh, to your first question, uh, when I started to write my book and to explore this literature on peace plans, peace, the history, in fact, I, I was trying to think about the history of Europe, the low Euro history of Europe, through the lens of peacemaking. So because the traditional 
narrative on European history is through, you know, focused on great events, big events. Uh, that means wars, revolutions, strong commotions, military glory, Napoleon, etc. So that was, so that it's a very different perspective. And I was starting to work uh, on this book, and I remember some of my um, um, colleagues, historians, was quite skeptical about such a project. And they're saying, wow, a book on peace uh, in Europe, that would be the shortest book ever. <laughs> you know, which peace in Europe? It's a history of wars, uh, violence, you know. It's a <laughs> but it happened that it became a very long uh, book indeed. And I had, uh, I cut, I needed to cut the manuscript by twice, so twice longer. Oh, wow. And, and that was basically rewriting, because that it's uh, again. So, and uh, indeed, we can, uh, you know, take your approach and uh, suggestion to think about kind of ex post about all these uh, peace uh, plans and peace treaties. And, uh, but that will be another book, for sure. Mm -hmm. So that it's... Um, Osnabrück. Uh, hmm? Osnabrück. The yeah, so it's again, it's a, it's a criteria that doesn't, you know, that I, I needed really to clarify very clear, to give some clear criteria, my choice. So it was a decision on my part. So in that, it's precise, it was not part of uh, this main uh, three criteria of, my, of the pattern. So that is a kind there of... There is another book. That's so beautiful in academic life. There is another book. Wha there is to live on. You know, I yeah. really hope that one of my PhD students, graduate students, or your students, will explore one day <laughs> this huge and important literature on the plans of perpetual peace of the 18th, 19th century. It's such a fascinating literature in 12 languages. I collected more than 200 plans of perpetual peace, so everyone was thinking about that. And making perhaps connection, yeah, yeah so with uh, connection also with um, uh, US President Wilson's library. So when he was in post during the negotiation in Versailles and the peace treaty in uh, Paris after World War I, he was receiving peace plans from around the world. So the name changed. During the 18th and 19th century, this plan was called plans of perpetual peace. So in 20th century, late 19th century, early 20th, they switched to peace plans, just it became peace plans. So, and uh, there it's a huge collection, the so-called Wilson Library, which is part of the archive of the League of Nations in Geneva. Big boxes, which really need, you know, young historians who are ready to involve. And that it's another very important literature. So, and I really hope that the peace history will not be the only one in the world because that it's, uh, you know, always quite marginalized and thinking, you know, in other idealists, so they are dreaming. So it's a history of dreams. So no, because I consider that history of peace and peacemaking, it's a pragmatic approach. So that it's a kind pragmatic of... Pragmatic is point. a good word. <laughs> we, we need to be pragmatic about the time. I apologize. <laughs> um, let's say thank you to Stella. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Two last steps, two last steps. One, you get officially the award. There, there is also a cash prize that comes with it, that, but there will be an invisible hand giving you the cash prize. <laughs> can, I, can I give you the prize here? <laughs> Congratulations. We take a picture. Look overjoyed, but humble. So we need to move yes. a little. <laughs> yes, yes. Over here, yes. Good. Great. One more. Pragmatic. We have to be pragmatic, sir. <laughs> it's heavy. <laughs> You don't have to applaud. This is fine. It's fine. <laughs> One more. Congratulations, Thank Stella. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank and, you. Um, <laughs> my words of thanks. Thank you for the lecture. Brad, thank you for the lovely introduction. I want to thank uh, Melky and the team for the tech support, and the uh, Becca Prince and, and Mel and Grant for making this event what it was. Have a lovely evening. Thank you so much and see you again. There will be another Lorsch and Book Prize winner. And if there's another book <laughs> from you, you may be elected. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank, Thank you. you.